Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you so much for joining us once again on Health Professional Radio. In this segment, we're going to have a brief conversation with Dr. Stephen Williams. He's joining us here from Soma Logic to discuss proteomics. He's going to tell us what proteomics is, how it's used in both drug discovery and in prognostic and diagnostic testing. He's also going to tell us how it differs from genomics. Welcome to Health Professional Radio, Dr. Stephen Williams. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. Good to be here. Well, tell our listeners a bit about yourself and your role at Somalogic. I'm Chief Medical Officer at Somalogic, which, which really means uh, running our internally funded clinical research programs and regulatory and quality. Um, and our research programs are really geared around developing new tests that measure current health states or future risks or the impact of behaviors um, in individuals. Now, it's my understanding that Somalogic is, is a global leader in, in proteomics. What exactly is proteomics um, and how is it significant? Proteomics is the study of, of protein network patterns. Uh, and we're, uh, we're focused on the human here. And the analogy I like to make is it's really like the body's internet, that the patterns of proteins in serum or plasma or the body or cells They've evolved to actually communicate information uh, from one biological system to another. And they are the targets of 95% of all known drugs. And so if you think about proteomics, it's really a, an information system. And our job is to try and decode and extract that information out and make it actionable and useful to clinicians and to academics and drug developers. With 90% of drugs being targeted toward proteins, how is proteomics significant in drug discovery and testing as well? Yeah, well, in the, in the, as far as helping people develop new drug products or understand biology, back to the internet analogy, if you want to interrogate the internet, you need bandwidth and a search engine. And bandwidth really in this context means measuring thousands of proteins at once sometimes in thousands of people. And the search engine that, that we've started to use is, is artificial intelligence and machine learning to try and decode those signals and relate them to clinical truths that are, that are known about these subjects, the participants in these big clinical trials. So on the one hand, uh, people who want to understand more about biology, uh, it's a gift uh, for them, uh, some of them who've been collecting samples for decades in thousands of people, to suddenly be able to measure 7,000 proteins at once in each of their precious samples um, is, a, is a fantastic uh, opportunity for them. And then as far as developing new tests, of course, you've got the basic science, you've got people developing new drugs who want to learn uh, whether those drugs are safe or effective and how long they work for and what the dose response should be. And then as far as healthcare goes, can you turn some of those protein network patterns into actual accurate prognostic tests? So those are the three ways I think, uh, I think it's generally used. Uh, understanding of, of disease and health, imp improving the productivity of drug development, and uh, new tests for diagnosis and prognosis in healthcare. Did we tackle some of the same challenges with genomics? Is it similar? I think some of the machine learning applied to it is similar, but, but the key difference here is that, that if, if, if I'm, I'm make back to the same analogy, sorry, if proteomics is like the internet, genomics is like your computer hard drive. And I don't know what your hard drive is like, but mine has some things on it that I used yesterday, some things I hadn't used for three years, and then a whole bunch of stuff that maybe it's never been used. Um, so it's a fixed entity. Um, whereas if you want to know what's going on today, you need to interrogate the internet, which is where, where the proteomics comes in. And I think that when we look at, at how genomics has contributed to precision medicine, it's made some fantastic contributions. But if you take an average hundred people, only four of them will have a, an actionable genetic variant. And maybe one of them might be pregnant and could use prenatal screening. And unfortunately, one of them may have cancer and they could have their tumor uh, genomics profiled. But the other 94 people, genetic precision medicine has nothing useful to say about them today. The polygenic risk scores that people have developed 
tend to be less powerful than combinations of demographics and, and other risk factors. So there's a, there's a, genomics has a fantastic and useful niche, but actually most conditions that, that affect most people most of the time are not actually helped by existing genomic knowledge. Well, let's talk about Somologic's new blood test. Uh, I understand that it can predict the risk of heart attack and stroke. Yeah, what we wanted to do with the with this platform that measures seven thousand proteins, the SomaScan platform, was to to tackle medical conditions that were serious and common, and where interventions already exist. We didn't have to invent invent them, but where applying them to the right person at the right time was a problem, or actually convincing an individual that they needed to take something was a problem, and that's why cardiovascular disease came to the top because. It kills more people than anything else. Um, and there are interventions, but many people aren't taking them or, or, or physicians don't know that someone needs them. Mm-hmm. And so that's where we went first. And what we did then was to run actually what turns out to be one of the largest proteomic studies ever performed. Currently, it's about 40,000 people in 12 different clinical studies. But what we did was to take the clinical truth, which was known about these people. So there was from large biobanked samples uh, from from clinical studies that already existed. Plasma was available and frozen and the clinical truth was known. So did these people have a heart attack, a stroke? Were they hospitalized for heart failure or did they die within the next four years? And we chose four years because 10 years, which many risk factor models use, is a bit like credit card debt. It's kind of you're never going to have to pay it. It's not so convincing mm-hmm. to most people when you're telling them they should take a medicine that they don't really want to take. So we, we chose four years and we trained our model. In other words, we measured thousands of proteins in these thousands of people where the truth was known. And the machine learning uses the known truth to find the best combination of proteins that actually mimics the truth. And that turned out to be 27 proteins out of the thousands that we measured in a mathematical equation. Um, And it's able to accurately discriminate between people who are or are not going to get a heart attack or a stroke or heart failure or die. And just to put it in context, if you're in the bad group, which on average about about one in five people are in the bad group, Mm -hmm. the event rate in four years, so how many people died or had an event, is about one in two. So half of them will have an event. The average time to event is about 18 months. And the commonest kind of event event was death. So this is not just picking up some general vague risk association. If you're in that bad group, it's catastrophic near-term risks. Mm. The other thing that we found was that if you're in the other end, if you're in the low group, in the bottom 20%, you had an eight-fold lower observed event rate. So this dynamic range, if you like, the difference between the bad group and the good group was two to three times greater than any combination of existing risk factors or blood tests or genetic risk scores. How can healthcare providers and patients access your uh, your test? And give us a website where our listeners can learn more. The website is www.somologic.com. And at the moment, we're just beginning to scale the, the availability of this test Um, in healthcare. So we're working with several large health systems and some concierge physicians. So at the moment, uh, most physicians don't yet have access, but we will dramatically be expanding access to this test over the next uh, few months. Uh, It's available as a a laboratory developed test from our central lab. And at the moment, the most common application for it is if you take people with diabetes who are not on one of these new enhanced cardioprotective drugs, it's a very useful way of finding out who really needs extra cardio protection because the new drugs, SGLT2 drugs and GLP-1 drugs, they don't relate to blood pressure or cholesterol or known risk factors. They're completely novel bio- biochemical mechanisms. And so you need a test that uncovers this and exposes this uh, residual risk that these people might need to have resolved by interventions that already exist. Right. So I'd say that that's probably the most important near-term application for the product. 
I have enjoyed speaking with you this morning, Stephen. I appreciate your time, and hopefully you'll uh, you'll come back and tell us how uh, this test is progressing, more about its availability, and we'll, we'll get the word out to physicians about its availability. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with Dr. Stephen Williams. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com healthprofessionalradio.